going to tell you a little bit uh, about our work on hand, foot, and mouth uh, disease. Today, um, it's a small group, so at any time, if you are confused about anything, feel free to stop me. Okay. Um, hand, foot, and mouth disease obviously means uh, anyone who has kids, uh, parents who have young kids will know, uh, the kids who have, get hand, foot, and mouth disease have rashes, uh, kind of blister-like looking rashes on their palms, soles of their feet, and ulcers in their mouth, and sometimes can present as sore throat. Uh, in general, it is not a very serious disease, but it is just um, the kids get, uh, get painful and they're miserable in general because with the ulcers, they can't really drink and can't really swallow uh, when it's really bad. And um, so most of the time during this period, all they can do is maybe uh, eat some ice cream and try to uh, get hydrated. Uh, okay. Uh, but this disease is endemic to Singapore, uh, meaning we can't get rid of it, at least not right now. And so, for example, here, I took this picture from the Straits Times uh, last year. Uh, that was kind of near the peak of uh, the hand, foot and mouth season uh, last year. So they were trying to compare what's the difference in number of cases between the previous year, 2017, and last year, 2018. And this year, we are, we are just past uh, this period, I think. So... Um, and uh, the basically every year, hand, foot, and mouth disease makes the rounds around all the uh, most of the preschools and uh, indoor playgrounds. So, uh, I have young kids too, so I kind of see indoor playgrounds as uh, reservoirs of germs and uh, viruses and bacteria. <laughs> okay, but anyway, uh, okay, uh, in other words, there are about 20 to 30 cases um, a year, and it's highly contagious, uh, so you can, the kids get it very easily from uh, going to school where there are congregations of kids, parties, indoor playgrounds. Adults can get it too. Uh, in fact, sometimes the adults get it much worse. Uh, there was this report, I think about two years back, where the mom got it from the child, and then uh, after the child recovered, and she sort of recovered, and her hair started dropping, her fingernails started dropping. I think this was, this was the uh, scary, there were some scary photos making around on social media. So, uh, not, not, this doesn't happen most of the time, but uh, apparently can happen to some people. Okay, uh, as I said just now, there's a uh, great discomfort to the child during about the one week or, or so. Loss of appetite because of ulcers in the mouth. Uh, but in general, it's not. Uh, they recover after that. Okay, and uh, so it's considered mild and self-limiting. Uh, self-limiting meaning it doesn't spiral into something worse in general uh, but during this period say about a period of seven to ten days uh, they're not able to go to school so it's only once the doctor certifies that okay the, this kid uh, one week later comes in is free of hfmd rashes then okay then they can uh, go back to school again which means obviously uh, if they go to daycare every day then we need to make alternative childcare arrangement and if the kids have siblings then they need to be segregated unless uh, you want to do one of those chicken pox parties where you get everyone with hand, foot and mouth together then you won't have to separate them but it's just a, just a pain okay, in general uh, and the thing about HFMD is you can't really get immune to it not like chicken pox okay, you can get it again like next year you can get it again uh, because there are different uh, viruses uh, different strains of virus causing this disease. Now, this disease is caused by uh, viruses. Uh, the main group in Singapore uh, is the Coxsackie Group A viruses. Uh, there's more than one. And there is this other virus called Enterovirus 71, uh, which is the most, causes the most serious type of uh, HFMD. Uh, this is the one virus strain where uh, some uh, kids, when they get it, do develop more serious complications, meaning the virus can be found in their brains, in their lungs, in their hearts, and it can actually be fatal. And so this is the virus where uh, most of the research have focused on uh, so far. Um, and in 2018, so just last year, EB71, enterovirus 71, uh, claimed two toddlers in Malaysia. And concurrently, there was an increase in the proportion of um, EB71 circulating in Singapore. Uh, last year. But in general, in Singapore, most of the time, the viruses that we tend to have is the Kawasaki group, which causes a milder form of HFMD. Okay, now, in general, when we talk about infectious diseases, usually they are either caused by bacteria or virus. Okay, now in bacteria, we all know that we can use antibiotics, although obviously the um, everyone says you shouldn't just anyhow use antibiotics because you can get uh, 
the development of resistance, then the bacteria won't be susceptible, meaning they won't you you won't be able to kill them with antibiotics anymore in future. Now, what about viruses? Uh, there's no such thing as antibiotics for viruses. Uh, when you get a viral infection, you just rely on your own immune system. Okay, and anything that the doctor can give you is just to treat the symptoms, just to make you feel better uh, during that period when your immune system fights the virus. But really, it depends on you. Okay. Um, oh yeah, and I should say that the reason uh, that's the case is because um, bacteria are living cells. Okay, they are uh, like our cells, living cells, but they operate on a different system. So it is possible to develop. Uh, drugs like antibiotics that can target a different living system. But viruses are not actually living. They're not living until they infect our cells and then they make use of our system. Hence, it's really difficult to want to target uh, viruses in that sense because you will then kill um, uh, the cells that the viruses are operating in. Uh, unless in certain other uh, scenarios, which I will go into later. So what actually happens when our cells get infected by uh, viruses? Uh, I will first take a little bit of... Um, uh, side track to talk about in the first place what makes different types of cells. So um, I think even with no biology background, uh, we all sort of know that um, we come about from uh, one cell uh, in the very beginning, and then that divides and divides and divides and eventually the billions of cells. And so the all the billions of cells uh, in our body pretty much carries the same DNA or the same genes. Okay, so, but why is it that some of the cells in our body become skin cells, why some become liver cells, even though they all carry the same genes. And it's because um, of this thing called the central dogma or just the rule in biology, where uh, the DNA, which I'm sure we've all heard about before, uh, is basically the genes in our cells, and all the information is stored in there. And then um, when we say that a gene is turned on and off, okay, then it just means that that information gets... Um, encoded or made into this thing called RNA, which we may not have heard of before, but uh, it's actually pretty simple to understand. It just encodes the information in the gene, uh, but it's a different molecule. And then uh, this step from DNA to RNA uh, basically means the gene is turned on. Okay, So if you turn on some uh, genes to do with making neurons, nerve cells, then the cell will eventually become an organ. You turn on some genes to do with making muscle, then eventually the cell will become muscle cells, even though all the cells carry the same genes. Now, uh, but uh, actually there's one more step from RNA to protein. And um, proteins are the ones, uh, they, you can think of them as the foot soldiers uh, in the cell because they are the ones that carry out the work. The RNA is just a so-called messenger molecule. It carries the information. And eventually the information has to be turned into a protein. Then the protein can go and do stuff uh, in the cell. Okay, Like make a cell become a muscle cell, for example. Okay. Now, um, to put it in a pictorial form, all the DNA in our cells is stored in this thing called the nucleus. This is a cell. And there's a nucleus. So it's just kind of like a brain of the cell. And then um, when um, genes are turned on and uh, the genes make some RNAs, where the information, the genes is encoded in these things called RNAs. Um, and then you need uh, a ribosome. Uh, ribosome is this purple thing. It's just a machine to make the protein. You okay, take the information in the RNA to make the protein. Okay, then the ribosome will uh, go through this mRNA and do this thing called translation. It's just translate as if you translate from English to Chinese or translate from the information in RNA to protein. And then that will make some protein, which is this green stuff over here. And then the proteins are going to do the whatever. Okay, um, so what happens when uh, we get infected by viruses? So when there's a virus, Okay, the virus comes along and um, enters the cell. And then there would be this, uh, we're, we're talking just about RNA viruses because the viruses causing HFMD are RNA viruses. Okay, So uh, meaning their genome or their genetic information is uh, made up of RNA. Unlike us, ours is made out of DNA. Okay, the viral RNA will enter the cell with this red stuff over here. And um, the viral particle, which is this one, actually carries very little material. Maybe it just carries, say, one strand or two strands of RNA. This thing would enter the cell. And um, what the virus would do is that it would divert or hijack. You can think of it as a hijack. It would hijack all the ribosomes and all the other factors in the cell that is needed to make proteins towards itself, like that, so that then it can make more copies of itself, make viral proteins, and eventually make more viral particles that then uh, burst out of the cell to infect other cells. So that's the way uh, viruses work. Okay, now um, I mentioned RNA viruses. So HFMD uh, 
causing uh, viruses causing HFMD are caused by RNA viruses, and they are very quick to do this thing called acquiring resistance, which is kind of uh, the same way as how bacteria gain resistance to antibiotics. Um, the reason is um, because um, uh, let me give you an example. Our own genes, which is in the form of DNA, is um, replicated or reproduced uh, very, uh, very strictly. So there is a there are many steps to check that we make the same copy of DNA over and over again. So then they don't change. The sequence doesn't change. Uh, these changes are called mutations. Right? There, there don't, there's no mutation. Then the uh, the replication is called high fidelity replication. It just it, faithful to the sequence that's originally there. But if the um, when uh, viruses or RNA viruses reproduce or they make more copies of their genome, uh, since they are RNA, they're not DNA, um, just the simple, uh, the mere fact that if you try to make more copies of RNA, there are just not many checks and balances uh, steps involved. So it's uh, natural that when viruses try to make more copies of themselves, they um, would end up with mutations in their sequence. So the new copies wouldn't be exactly the same as the old copies. Okay, so that's how they are able to acquire resistance. Um, why? Because let's say I um, make some drug and target some sequence uh, in the virus or target some protein made by the virus. Okay, and it's a very specific uh, protein, very specific protein uh, information. Then if the next time the virus infects another cell, and uh, it tries to make more copies of itself, uh, now the new virus uh, copy of RNA has some changes in the sequence, then uh, the protein that it makes would change. So then my drug may not be able to target this thing anymore. And that's how the virus becomes resistant uh, to the drug. Okay, so RNA viruses are quick to acquire resistance in this way. Now, you notice that the way I drew these uh, ribosomes here, I didn't draw all ribosomes going to the virus, um, viral RNAs. I left some... Um, ribosomes on the host mRNAs. Uh, this is not, um, I didn't forget these three ribosomes here, but this is by design. Okay, um, it's because uh, even though most of the ribosomes get diverted to uh, make more copies of the virus, there are some uh, host uh, mRNAs, host meaning us, ourselves, uh, because we are the host for the virus. Uh, there are some host RNAs that remain um, made, remain translated by these ribosomes. And um, because there are some host mRNAs that continue to remain translated or their proteins continue to get made even during the infection. Uh, it likely suggests that these, the proteins that are made by these RNAs are very highly needed by the virus. Otherwise, why would the ribosome continue making proteins from these host mRNAs? Everything should be diverted away. Okay, so um, the hypothesis or uh, the logic is that if uh, the virus needs some ribosomes to remain, to still synthesize or make proteins from some of these RNAs, uh, probably means that the virus needs the protein products from these hosts still for some reason. Okay, so this is the um, uh, our project is trying to so we're trying to find out or identify these RNAs that continue to be made so that we can then develop um, some drugs to target these uh, RNAs because we are not going to target the viral sequence, then we won't suffer from this problem as much. Where the virus acquires resistance quickly. Okay. Anyway, um, before I go into uh, how we identify, uh, just remember that we're trying to identify some of these. So meaning we want to know the sequence of this stuff over here because if we know the sequence, then we know which RNA and which gene uh, is needed by the virus. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about slightly technical uh, over here of how we identify these uh, sequences that are still covered by ribosomes. So there's this technique that we use in the lab called ribosome profiling. Uh, it sounds uh, complicated, but really it's not that complicated. It just means that we try to identify the footprints of the ribosomes. Okay, let me explain. So if you have some cells growing in some dish, right? Okay, and then you break the cells. And then there would be these, um, these things, which are really just mRNAs with ribosomes making the uh, proteins of the mRNAs. Uh, which we can then um, try to cut with an enzyme. So we can cut all the RNAs. The enzyme will cut RNA. So we can cut the RNA that's in between all the ribosomes. That leaves behind uh, ribosomes plus the small little piece of RNA that the ribosome happened to be sitting on at that point in time. It was not cut by the enzyme because the ribosome was blocking the enzyme from cutting it. 
Okay. Now, then we can get rid of this ribosome. And then we want what we want is this little um, pieces of RNA, which we call the footprints of the um, ribosome. Uh, and then what we can uh, then basically try to sequence uh, these short little um, pieces. And once we get the sequence, it's like a zip code. Right? It tells us we can do this uh, mapping back to the human genome and we will know uh, which uh, genes were uh, had RNAs in the cell at that point in time and their RNAs were covered by ribosomes at that point in time because the ribosome was trying to make protein of the RNA. Okay. Now, um, so what we do is we... Um, then since we want to know what uh, RNAs uh, in the host continue to make proteins during a viral infection, what we'll do is we will add some virus to the cells and then we will follow uh, the infection uh, as it goes along. At uh, the very beginning, and before there was any virus, uh, we basically take the cells, break them up and then measure RNA levels, basically just measure or identify which RNAs are present. And then as well as measure translation levels. Measure translation levels is basically the technique uh, that was mentioned in the last slide where we identify these um, short sequences covered by the ribosomes. Okay. Uh, if we then do this same thing, uh, say every couple of hours after we add the virus, we are basically following the changes in so-called gene expression or the making of proteins um, across an, an infection time course. Okay. Now, um, let me just give you a very uh, brief snapshot of act some actual uh, data. Now, uh, if I don't draw the viral RNA as a squiggly line, I can instead maybe add some more labels to it. It really doesn't matter some of these um, words over here. But this is EV71, which is the virus uh, that causes the complication of HFMD that we're trying to study here. Um, we uh, have, uh, say, uh, at zero hours, that means uh, before we add the virus, <clears throat> okay, uh, we break the cells and measure RNA levels and measure the ribosome footprints. And if you imagine on the uh, x-axis here, I have this entire sequence over here, okay, such that uh, this part, which is called the coding region, is over here. The coding region uh, sounds complicated, but it's really not. It just means the part of the viral RNA that makes protein, okay. And you see many lines over here. It's because the virus squeezes a lot of uh, proteins into a small region. So one small region makes lots and lots of proteins. Okay. Now, um, if you can see that at uh, zero hours, I mean, when there's no virus, uh, we can our sequencing technique can um, map uh, what's the um, whether there are any footprints, whether there are any RNA coming from the viral RNA itself in addition to the human genome. Okay. So if I follow from uh, zero hours all the way to eight hours uh, during the infection time course. This is uh, kind of uh, what you see here. At the RNA level, so the RNA, meaning the amount of viral RNA that's present, it sort of increases a little bit. Uh, and then, but the translation level, which is the, um, the amount of protein making from the virus by the ribosomes in the cell, increases a lot. Okay. Um, so, uh, you basically just need a few copies of the viral RNA in the cell and then you can just make a lot, a lot of uh, viral proteins uh, just by hijacking the host uh, ribosomes. Now, at the same time, also anyway, virus expression increases really quickly, okay? So, uh, I'm going to... Uh, so, what happens to the host side of the picture? Because that's what we wanted to identify, the host uh, genes or mRNAs that remain um, translated. So I'm going to take a little sidetrack here to talk about this thing called polysome profiling, which is not the same as ribosome profiling, but kind of similar. Uh, so imagine if I break the cells and then instead of um, putting an enzyme to cut the RNA, I put it onto a tube of sucrose solution. Okay, so this increased purpleness just means increasing sweetness. <laughs> okay, this is just a linear sucrose gradient in technical terms. Okay, now then we can spin this tube really hard. Okay, this is a cell... This is a cell extract, right? Put on top of a, uh, in a tube of a sucrose um, solution. And then we can spin it really hard, known as ultra centrifugation. What it will do is uh, the extract will go into the uh, sucrose solution or sugar solution. And the, all the components in the extract will separate according to size and shape because of this very high speed spin. Okay. And then if I then tilt the tube uh, horizontal and then I try to measure from the very top to the very bottom, 
um, how the individual components settle along this tube. Uh, and then uh, what we can do is we can read the absorbance at a certain wavelength uh, that reads uh, RNA. And uh, this is what we will see. This, is, this kind of thing is called a polysome profile. And um, if you see this region over here, there are many peaks. Polysomes just refer to things like this, uh, this, which is many, many ribosomes strung together by an mRNA. Okay, enough technicality. Okay, so what happens in our cells? What happens to the host gene expression when our cells get uh, infected by viruses? So here it goes. This is a polysome profile at zero hours. And then um, remember this section? This is the polysome uh, section. Okay, and then this uh, section over here is the single ribosome section. Um, if you look at what happens from zero hours, two, four, six, eight, you can see that the, the green section sort of goes down and the pink section sort of goes up. And it's because this each polysome profile is giving us a snapshot of a host translation. Host translation is basically going down because that's represented by this, the amount of polysomes uh, there are in the cell. Okay, as all the ribosomes get diverted to translate viral material, uh, host uh, polysomes that are still translating host mRNAs is going down. Okay, which is uh, actually we already knew that was going to happen. Host translation drops. Um, but what we can do is we can um, grab some genes from our data. Um, we can quantify thousands of genes at once. You can see thousands of genes at once, what's happening to them. So what we can do is um, take these genes and um, look at their translation levels in the, this sort of color-coded heat map. Um, can you sort of see that this heat map, this thing is called a heat map, is made out of many, many different horizontal lines squished together. Every single line here is one gene. Okay, And then um, here is, a, a, in this axis is time. So here's increasing uh, time into the infection. Uh, if the lighter color, that means the, uh, the gene is getting more translated, or the RNA is getting more translated. Darker color means it's going down. And then we see this cluster over here. That means there's a group of genes whose uh, translation, whose host translation is uh, not just maintained, but it's going up. Okay, so this is the one that we wanted. These are the genes that we wanted. During an infection, um, we want to know which mRNAs in the host cell uh, continue to make protein. Okay, and since these are going up the higher, so we zoom in on this. And then, um, okay, now it turns out that this group of genes are uh, functionally related. Okay, I, I wouldn't uh, sort of uh, elaborate on what they are, but they are known as GTPase-related genes. Doesn't matter uh, what GTPase is at the moment. Okay, now um, I just want to give you another look at uh, the data uh, in, this, uh, in this form, which is uh, what we call a volcano plot. Okay. Now, if you look at early on uh, in the infection, every dot here is one gene, and the purple dots are this, uh, each purple dot is a GDPase-related gene identified from the previous slide, okay? And uh, this graph, we are measuring RNA uh, regulation or whether RNA levels are going up or down. In this graph, we are measuring whether translation levels are going up or down. Okay, um, here, uh, the way to uh, look at, to understand this, uh, plot of this graph is that anything that falls in this uh, greenish segment would be considered as going up. Anything that falls in the pink region would be considered as going down. Okay. Now, remember in the previous slide, we see that this group of genes, their translation was going up okay, a lot. So actually, you can see them uh, in this form. The purple dots are going higher and higher into the green region, meaning their translation is going up. Okay. Now, if you look at their RNA levels, that means the RNA levels of these purple genes, they are actually in the middle all the time, the very same genes that we are looking at. That means the, during an infection, during an EV71 infection, the, uh, for some reason, these purple genes, their RNAs continue to make a lot of protein. I mean, they make, in fact, they make more protein than before the infection. And, but they are, the level of the RNA molecule uh, doesn't increase. It's just that you make more protein from this RNA. Okay, so that means if we can target these genes, we can target... Um, the virus because it, uh, it's highly likely that the virus needs the function from these uh, proteins that are made by these purple uh, RNAs. And that's why they continue to be made during an infection. Okay, now, um, so uh, just now I drew a really simplified uh, diagram of what happens to a, 
uh, when a virus enters a cell. But this is kind of a slightly complicated way, but still simplified. Okay, if your virus, let's say your EV71, there are many steps from the virus entering and then making some viral protein and then uh, packaging into new virus and then eventually exiting the cell and then go on to uh, infect other cells. And in between, it also makes more copy of the, uh, copies of the viral RNA so that that can get packaged into the cell. So any, as long as you can target any single step within this pathway, we would have targeted uh, the virus. It doesn't uh, mean that we have to target anything on the virus itself, but as long as anything, um, any particular step in this pathway relies on the host gene's function to be able to work and we target that gene in the host, then we will be able to target the virus. Okay. Now, um, one of the questions that uh, is naturally comes from wanting to target host factors is, how can you target host factors without harming the host? Okay, because obviously the host factor is there because the host needs, needs it for some reason, right? Yeah. So it's all about thresholds and uh, thresholds and concentrations. Okay, let me explain. Okay. Now, if... Um, on the y-axis is concentration, on the x-axis is uh, time, and then you are trying to target this whatever factor called x, okay? Um, let's say you have uh, developed a drug against x, then as your drug increase, x, uh, the concentration of x would decrease, or whatever x function is. Now, if the virus needs the concentration of x at a certain threshold, that means it needs, absolutely needs x to be present at here and above, then as long as, um, uh, X falls below this concentration, the virus won't be able to reproduce anymore, then you would have targeted the virus. Now, the, on the flip side, let's say the host has a, a host has a similar threshold for X, okay, because it's a host factor. But if it's a it's kind of a low threshold, then even if you reduce X to this amount, you, you are still um, at a level that's acceptable to the host. Okay, the host can still function because it's above the critical threshold that the host needs. So in other words, anything that is over here, uh, the virus would die and the host would survive. Okay, so what if the host um, actually has a higher threshold for this factor X? So for example, like this, the host threshold is a little bit higher uh, and it's higher than the lowest point where you can lower X2. Then it just means that your window of opportunity sort of reduces to this much. Okay, at this window, where you reduce X, uh, the concentration, concentration of X, uh, it falls below the amount that the virus would need, but it's still above the amount that the host would need. So that's still possible to target. Now, I know that this is kind of abstract, so I um, uh, try to think about it another way. So another way you can use to understand this, how do you keep everyone happy with clothes in the drawer? Okay, so now if we change all the names on the axis and on the labels, let's say Y axis is the condition of the clothes in your drawer, and X is time. And over time, let's say in the beginning, right, you folded all the clothes and then the drawer is really neat. And over time, it will just get messier and messier. So the neatness of clothes in the drawer would fall. Um, maybe all you need is some kits, right? Then it will mess up the uh, condition of clothes uh, in your drawer. Okay, so at this level, this is Marie Kondo uh, threshold, where all your clothes are neatly folded and arranged according to the colors of the rainbow very nicely. Okay, but most people don't do that. I think as long as we fold them, the clothes, and they end up in the drawer, then we're okay. So this is also my threshold. Okay, as long as the clothes are somewhat here, and I'm pretty happy. Okay, now, so I'm happy up to this point. Okay, until the kids come and mess it up, and then I'm unhappy. Okay, this is the way you can think about it. Now, over time, obviously, when the clothes end up like this, and they're not really in the drawer and not really folded, then I'm even more unhappy. But this is me, right? Somebody else might have a different threshold. For example, my husband, right, who has a threshold of about here. And um, as long as the clothes are not on the floor and they're somewhat half in, half out of the drawer, he is happy all the time, okay? So um, this is the exact same graph that we were looking at one previous uh, slide ago. It's just that labeled a different way. So now I'm sure all of you can understand this uh, perfectly, right? Okay, so uh, thank you very much.